Well, thank you, Communicate, very much for asking me to come here. Um, I think in view of some of the things I'm going to say um, in the next few minutes, and perhaps in discussion, I ought to declare at the outset that actually I'm rather in favour of human beings. I think they're, they're rather nice and have done some wonderful things throughout our 175, 200,000 year history. And I'm very anxious that we should go on because the sun's probably got about another two and a half to three billion years of life of use to us and there's no reason why we shouldn't stay with it. But we will have to change our ways. Okay, I'm not anti-human. Many people who talk about population control are denounced as anti-human and many other things as well. As well. Now, there is a lot of denial. The, our societies across the world are full of population deniers. You've heard of climate deniers, but there are population deniers and what would I say, population asiders, people who just say that's out there. Um, I am always aware of what I think is a most unfair asymmetry in attitudes of people who are campaigning on environmental issues in the broadest sense. If I go to somebody from uh, Christian Aid or the Worldwide Fund for Nature uh, or the Green Party and start talking about population, they'll say, oh, it's not population. It's greed, gross inequality, poverty, the status of women. Twenty Bangladeshis don't pollute as much as one Britain. When I go up to somebody, uh, or somebody approaches me and says, I'm very concerned about poverty and inequality, I don't say to them, it's not poverty and inequality, it's population. People, we really must get to a point where we can understand that all of us, taking up, if you like, our different particularities, are addressing the same issue of how our species is to go on living, surviving on a planet, together one hopes with a lot of other living organisms, indefinitely. But no, many people seem not to be able to recognize that what is not, it, ne, what is not sufficient is nevertheless absolutely necessary. And there's no question, in my mind, that population control, I'll say what I mean about that in a minute, is absolutely necessary because in the long run we are running up a down escalator. That's a great waste of effort and we're using all sorts of clever technology to um, help us overcome, maybe trying to slow the motor and give us a bit more lift in our shoes, but the motor is running on. Now, um, I think I'm really, I, I really want to say this to the audience and challenge you about this, that um, we must recognize that what is not sufficient is absolutely necessary. Because I was disappointed by John Bridle, a biologist this morning, um, really taking that attitude that pop is pop population, he said, but he, he was a population asider. I don't know if he's here still, I'll argue with him later. <laughs> now, um, I can't help seeing the world situation but from the view of a biologist. That's what I am. And therefore, looking around, I'm reminded of the wonderful words of Aldo Leopold in his Sand County Almanac, that the penalties of an ecological education are that one lives in a world of wounds. And he goes on to say that most people are not aware of the wounds of the environment. What do you mean, wounds? But the biologist knows what those wounds are, and I see them all around. I don't have to explain them to this audience. The destruction, the using up of the world's life support systems, the degradation of soils, of forests, of oceans, and grave loss of biodiversity. Now, of course, one of the immediate conclusions from this is that the Earth is already grossly overpopulated. We are living 
beyond the resources that the planet can yield. Okay, we're scrabbling around to find the last pockets of um, cheap fossil energy. It's not going to be so cheap as all that, but you know, the Turks and the Israelis and the Cypriots are squabbling at the moment about those gas reserves under the eastern Mediterranean. We'll go on doing that and we'll, you know, there will be people who say, well, you see, they, they, we're not running out of oil. Um, doesn't matter what that will do about climate control, Mark, but, but we will go on trying to hold that faith. And I think that it's all linked up with the, our complete adherence to conventional economics of growth. I mean, it's commonplace. I don't need to say anything to you now. If you look around, <laughs> listen to any news bulletin. We, in my view, we are flailing around trying to retain some faith in the standard economic growth models. Now, I am very sympathetic towards economists. We can't do without them. But we must recognize, and they must recognize, that they are not um, a, a very clear-cut um, set of facts which they are putting across to us. On every ecological issue, you will find distinguished economists on one side and on the other. Should we go for cutting back now uh, and waiting for growth to, uh, uh, as a way of supporting growth, or should we spend now in order to increase growth? Let us through the times on alternate days, and each of them will probably have a Nobel laureate economist in the, in the, um, uh, in the list of signatories. So in other words, it cannot be an exact science. It's applied psychology of the most complex type, and the models they have to use are pretty well on a level as the um, people trying to predict climate have to use. Many, many variables. Now, many economists show, I think, a flabbergasting ignorance of basic biological principles. Many of them assume quite explicitly that the world is limitless. We don't need to think about how the Earth's resources are going to provide the materials on which future economic growth will depend. It is not something they even consider. Writing in The Economist in October, um, a, a leading article pointing out how India was really in a much better position than China because China uh, was going to go into a, a demographic transition. There are going to be fewer young people in the future, whereas India had an enormous number of young people, 40% under the age of 16. And the economists thought this was utterly marvelous because that they were the, the workers in the factories of the future which was going to power India towards becoming, you know, two-car, one-yacht families. It's grotesque. At the same time, one could read figures saying that 34% of Indian children were undernourished. Look, I'm not suggesting that biologists ought to be running the economic structures of the earth. What, what I am suggesting is that we are one factor that should be taken into account and that we should actually have uh, biological input uh, when we're making uh, uh, economic models. Now, um, how to address these difficult figures, difficult points? Graham Russell this morning said, uh, I was so glad he said it, he took the words from my mouth. Uh, you have to begin from where people are. And here I take some encouragement from a recent poll which was commissioned by Population Matters, uh, a group that I'm concerned with. Um, it was a YouGov poll, you know, the standard thing, 3,500 people, balance for age, social class, uh, geography and so on. Well, anyway, the YouGov poll came, they were asked this question, do you, do you think that Britain, UK, would be a better place with more people, fewer people, same number, or it doesn't matter? Well, two of the figures were 65% ticked the box for a better place with fewer people. 1% ticked the box for more. Now, what are you going to read into that? And, of course, we had... Um, Jeffrey Beattie this morning, and we don't just read it superficially, do we? We want to know what's implicit as well as explicit there. But that's a fairly remarkable thing, isn't it? Sixty times as many people voted for fewer people than for more people. So, I think we have got some grounds for 
a bit of optimism. That's something we can build on. But of course, we'll have to help people to build on the real implications of what this means. Jeff Beatty said that 78% of people that he had polled were prepared to change their lifestyle to become greener. But had anybody put to them that this wasn't just downsizing your car a bit and fitting low energy light bulbs, but maybe not having a third child, even though you'd had two daughters to begin with and you'd really like a son. That is, of course, the best way to become green. Uh, it'll outdo a lot of four by fours and light bulbs, I assure you. But I'm not sure that many people are prepared to go that far yet. I noted DEFRA's list of changes that are needed for sustainability, which um, uh, Graham Russell put up. Uh, a lot of a lot of suggestions there as to what you should do and suggestions actually of um, uh, incentives and maybe even disincentives. But it didn't list, don't have that extra child as one of them. Now, governments of course say that they can't possibly interfere with a matter of such intimate personal choice. Bunkum and hypocrisy, ladies and gentlemen, governments and all kinds of other social structures have been interfering with people's intimate choice for centuries, but always to force them, to encourage them to have more children than they want. They've been offering fiscal incentives, Sweden, Germany, Japan, Malaysia at this moment, and Australia, part of the white commonwealth, should we say, that they are worried that already a grossly overpopulated country going to run out of water, they're, they're encouraging larger families. Have one for mum, one for dad, and one for Australia. Doesn't it give you a nice warm feeling? <laughs> now, um, the standard expansionist economic ideas, which are, we're worried about now, are because we, we believe we're an aging population how are we going to pay for our pensions in the future? Now, I'm not denying we have got to change all kinds of things. And it's not going to be an easy transition to a flat-sided population distribution. But to suggest that we need more young people to come in to pay pensions of those who are here now, that is a demographic Ponzi scheme. Old Bernie Madoff knew all about that. The way to keep the present customers happy is to bring in some new customers. But of course, the thing about this Ponzi scheme is that the young people you bring in, in various ways, they're going to grow old too. So they're going to need more young people to back up their pensions. And so ad infinitum. I don't believe it's rocket science, but it's unbelievable to me how readily um, governments go into a terror mode when they think that a population is not replacing itself, let alone get the numbers down. So, as I get older, I become more limited in what I expect. Um, for me, I just would be happy if we could get our society talking a lot about population and just recognizing that numbers are involved in every decision we make about our future. Just don't forget them, okay? They're there. And we're increasing, at the moment, 200,000 a day. All right. Now, there's plenty we can do immediately in Britain, I think. Um, we've very good evidence that 30%, we've had to put our own house in order, about 30% of pregnancies are unplanned. That's what the parents tell us, or often the single mother tells us. 30% are unplanned. That is a disgraceful statistic. What a way to bring a child into the world, just to have it happen. We have the highest rate of teenage pregnancy in Europe. And we have people who say that, you know, uh, sex education is encouraging promiscu promiscuity. Well, look across the channel to, uh, to the Netherlands. Now, of course, um, this is all a long-term business. The people who say it's not population, it's uh, poverty control and redistribution of resources, they have a point. We've got to tackle those problems now. If we tackle the population problem, it's going to take a long time for it to show through. 
but it's nevertheless absolutely necessary because the planet already is under severe strain. We're going to have to fight very hard to keep a decent representative of biodiversity, decent soils, good water, and so on. Even if we just stayed as we are now, I think we've got to slowly contract, but that's, let's get to base one first. Because if we don't, well, the down escalator is just over there and it's beckoning us. <laughs>